Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the German Museum Association and NEMO, the network of museum, European museum organizations, let me welcome to you to this digital conference on museums and social responsibility. I'm your moderator for today. My name is Catherine Hickley. I'm a freelance arts journalist and write regularly about museum policy for the art newspaper and also contribute to the, to the New York Times. We're happy to be able to report that 780 people registered to take part today, and we're looking forward to a full day of exciting contributions from across Europe. You're welcome to contribute at the end of each session with questions for our guests using the chat function. Let me take this opportunity to remind participants that this is the first of three conferences on the subject. The second will take place under the auspices of Portugal's presidency of the EU in April 2021. The third will be organized by Slovenia in the second half of next year. So my first thought on being asked to moderate, moderate this conference is that social responsibility is actually what museums are all about. It almost seems like tautology to mention them both in the same sentence. ICOM may be struggling to come up with an exact definition of what a museum is, but even the old definition makes this clear. Museums are about people more than they are about things. They are, to quote the old definition, non-profit institutions in the service of society. They exhibit the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study and enjoyment. During the coronavirus pandemic lockdown, it became clearer than ever that museums are one of society's most important meeting places for people and for ideas. At a time of polarizing opinions and social media bubbles, it's more important than ever to have a non-virtual public space for dialogue across social divides. Museums were sorely missed when they were closed. And I'm sure you will all have stories bearing witness to that. I hope we will hear some of them today. The reopening of the museums was eagerly awaited. I, for one, was straight on a train to Cottbus because Brandenburg was the first German state to reopen museums and went to see the Brandenburg State Museum of Modern Art as soon as it opened. But sadly, there are also many museums that will never reopen. According to an ICOM survey taken in April and May, as many as one in 10 museums around the world is threatened with permanent closure. As we're all aware, nearly all museums have been compelled to curtail activities. A third have had to lay off staff. All of this affects their capacity to carry out their social responsibilities. Freelance museum educators have tended to be among the first to lose their jobs or have their hours cut. This logically means that museums are educating less than they were before the pandemic struck. The pandemic devastation follows a long period of time where the tasks of museums have grown enormously. I'm thinking of digitization, provenance research and outreach, for example and budgets haven't necessarily expanded at the same pace as these spheres of activity. Many museums were already overstretched even before the pandemic hit. We're discussing six areas of social responsibility in this first conference called Values are Revisited. These are community involvement, education and culture, employment creation and skills development, technology development and access, and social investment. One of the downsides of a virtual conference is the lack of opportunity for networking in coffee breaks, but we have a solution. Please use the network function on your screen um, in the breaks. Um, a couple of other technical points that I'd like to make. Um, First of all, we want to make clear that the only part of the conference that will be recorded for posterity is what happens here on the main stage in Berlin. The chat will not be recorded, nor networking meetings. And please remember to keep your camera and microphone turned off unless you're speaking. 
Now let me introduce our first speaker. Dr. Horst Clausen has been a Referatsleiter, a head of division at the German Federal Culture, at, sorry, he has been at the federal, German Federal Culture Ministry since 1990. Since 2014, he's been responsible for visual arts museums and federal support for artists. He studied philosophy, art and history of literature in Munich and obtained a doctorate in history of art from Bonn University. Dr. Clausen, I'm happy to hand over to you. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this conference and want to thank the German Museum Association and NEMO, the network of European museums, organizations, for the warm welcome and for bringing us together today. On behalf of the federal government, Commissioner for Culture and the Media, Mrs. Monika Grütters, I want to express our appreciation of the thoughtful conception and organization of this conference. We want to thank our great partners from Portugal and Slovenia for making this trial conference possible and thank the distinguished experts for sharing their thoughts with us within the course of our program. The motto of the German EU Council Presidency Together for Europe's Recovery, describes the tough challenge for us, bringing cultural life out of the corona crisis. We want to make sure that culture can continue to fulfill its important role for European cohesion. As we all know, culture and cultural diversity in Europe are at the heart of our great European project. They remind us of our common heritage and at the same time show us the way to a European future. All of us have experienced that across border cultural life and cultural cooperations are most valuable pillars of our societies. The extent to which museums today reflect their roles as actors with social responsibility is expressed by the title given to this conference. We are convinced that culture and especially museums can make an important contribution support, to support social cohesion in Europe, especially, especially in these difficult days. In May 2019, on the occasion of last year's International Museum Day, Neil McGregor delivered a remarkable lecture in Brisbane, Australia. It was hosted by the Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art and had the noteworthy title, Museums and Memories, the Stories that Make a Community. In this formidable speech, which is available online, he examined the ways in which museums around the world are attempting to exhibit the past in order to confront the future with confidence. When outlining future challenges for museums in May 2019, of course, at this point of time, even Mr. McGregor could not foresee the dramatic consequences that a new virus would bring to the world at large and our museums in particular. However, Mr. McGregor reminded us of the important core. Museums are places where the long histories, complex histories, are acknowledged, discussed, debated, continued, and very important, are changed. To me, talking about social responsibility of museums is also very much a question of permanent change, a change of perspectives, 
a change of cultural awareness, a change of society expe expectations. The question of social responsibility of museums seems even more important if we agree that museums and more than just, are more than just cultural institutions, but playing a key role in defining and redefining national, international and communal identity. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very excited about this truly European conference with the change of a constructive dialogue and an open debate on the role of museums. Thank you very much for your attention and your commitment. Our next speaker is um, David Wium who has been director of the German Museums Association since 2017. Before this, he was head of the joint office of the Swiss Museums Association in ICOM Switzerland. He's chaired NEMO since 2014 and has been a board member since 2012. He studied art history, museology and business administration and gained extensive experience in network management at various museums and institutions. Additionally, David represents the museum sector in the German Cultural Council, Council and is a board member of the Swiss National Centre for, Centr for Cultural Heritage. Welcome, David. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Clausen, and thank you to all of you, dear participants, to have uh, accepted our invitation. As chair of NEMO, the network of museum of European museum organization, as director of the German Museum Association, I'm very happy that we take time today and tomorrow to speak, to think, and to exchange about the museum uh, and their so social responsibility. The work of museum and museum networks are based on values. NEMO and the German Museum Association, on behalf of the museum, um, stand for collection values, educational values, uh, economic values, and social values. We believe that museums are social places. It means meeting places where different uh, points of view can be shared as, place with, as places with which different people with different backgrounds uh, and capabilities can access. So equality, diversity, and inclusion are the basis of the social values we are promoting. We want museums to be recognized as organizations that can have a significant social impact. And this conference, is a great opportunity to reaffirm the social value of museums. L let me share with you some uh, personal observation. When I observe the museum sector, I think that museums which exploit their social potential have three specific qualities. They are involved, they are open-minded, and they are learning. Involved means that they are touched by what is going on around them. Uh, political polarization, migration issues, insufficient consideration for minorities, generation challenges, revenue and wealth gap, youth unemployment, and all the social problem. Of course, museum cannot solve all the social issues, but they can help to find solutions. Museum, um, I believe that museums have the potential to strengthen the social fabric of society and act as meeting places for different people. To play a social role, museums are not only involved in their time, in their environment, they are also involving people with different profiles. The second quality, to be open. Open means welcoming everyone. Open means in the corona crisis, reopening as soon as possible. Actually, museums shouldn't have been closed during the pandemic. 
our vision at least is that they should remain open and safe during every crisis. Open means accessible for everyone, analog and online. Open means open-minded. Museums which exploit their full social potential are not afraid of multi-perspectivity. They make differences visible. So they are not place for truth. We know that. They are place for knowledge negotiation. And that you are educating learning for the users, but museums strengthen their social role not only when they are places for education, they should be learning, they should be learning institution as well. For that, they learn from other sectors, they know and understand their audiences and their diversity, they learn from their audiences, they trust the creativity and the competency of their employees, they organize education and training program for their staff, they have a lean and efficient administration, and they adapt their structures and working processes to the community. So museums are involved and involving. Museums are opened and open-minded. And when museums are places for learning and learning places, they can contribute to strengthen the social fabric of society. With you, uh, dear participant, we want to redefine and clarify the question of the social responsibility in the museum sector. The field is large and wide. It's why this conference today and tomorrow is the first piece of three um, as Catherine said. And as you know, Mr. Clausen mentioned it before, Germany has started the so-called trio presidency of Germany, Portugal, and Slovenia. Together, the three uh, countries will form the trio presidency of the EU Council of the next 80s, 18 months. And on the museum field, we have decided to draw from this picture and to develop a conference program with our colleagues from Portugal and Slovenia. So we are telling a story in three parts. Today we focus on values. In April 2021 in Lisbon, we are going to speak about participation, networking, partnerships, and in September 2021 in Maribor, we are going to think about the future of social responsibility in the museum field. We are coming back to this trio conference this afternoon uh, at quarter to four with uh, Clara Camacho from Portugal and uh, Alexandra Berberis Lana from Slovenia, who are preparing the next conference. So thank you to our uh, partner, the commissioner of the German federal government for culture and the media. Thank you for the organizers, the team of NEMO, the team of the German Museum Association, especially Claudia Schneider for the organization, uh, for coordinating everything today. Thank you very much. To the speaker, thank you, of course. And to you, dear participant, to be there. I wish you a great conference. Thank you. you away from the, the Bodo Museum here in Berlin, where we are, to Denmark, um, which locked down because of the coronavirus crisis in April 2020. The first question at Trapholt was, how can we support our society? This became the collaborative art piece, Light Hope, which was created by 1,000 participants from all over Denmark during the lockdown under the direction of the artists Rasmus Beckelfax and Hannah G. The art piece was ready for the audience when the museum reopened in June 2020. Karen Grohn has been the director at the Trapholt Museum of Modern Art and Design since 2010. She was previously a curator there. 
Karen sees the coronavirus shock, the crisis as a shock and a wake-up call for museums to consider why we are here. She suggests we should learn from this and that we need organisational changes in the sector if it's to change in the long run to the benefit of society. She will welcome your questions in the chat after her presentation. Good morning, Karen. Thank you for inviting me. We're looking forward to hearing your presentation from Denmark. Thank you for having me to talk at this conference, the social impact of museums. Um, just to introduce who I am, I am the director of Traphold Museum of Modern Art and Design in Denmark, two hours drive from Copenhagen, around 100,000 visitors a year. It is, uh, it is um, the lowest educated area of Denmark, so we work in a different way than a museum which is in uh, the center of Copenhagen, for example. Um, the museum is beautifully located. It's a large museum. Uh, our collection is art, applied art and design. And uh, it is like a place where people go for the day. Uh, and I've been lucky to be the director since 2010. Um, hopefully I will start this video which is about the art piece Light Hope, which was introduced uh, pre, uh, just before. When the lockdown happened in Denmark, of course, we had terrible financial concerns about uh, how museum, how the Trapult would survive, whether we would go bankrupt. But this was the same situation for all museums in Denmark. So we decided to focus on something else. How could we deliver to the Danish uh, public? How could we create something which um, would give value for people who were now locked into their houses, who might feel isolated. And uh, we uh, then, over three weeks, very fast, uh, taught with artists and foundations in order to make create a big collaborative art piece called Light Hope. And the idea was that uh, we would like all of Denmark to participate with these um, crocheted light bulbs uh, that they could uh, either send to Denmark uh, to tap out, deliver or uh, deliver at this 27 different points in Denmark because people volunteered to uh, collect light bulbs. And the idea was also that people should be able to knit it with whatever they had. So the colors would be white, beige and yellow, which uh, we presumed would be ordinary colors in people's um, uh, crocheting bags. And uh, we also had a big Facebook which kind of exploded. People were really into this uh, amazing Facebook where they shared ideas, they shared uh, yarn, they shared crochet needles. Uh, so this became a really lively uh, community. And the idea was that we wanted to uh, crochet all the way through the lockdown. And then the day we opened, this piece would be there. And we also installed the art piece during the lockdown. So we had all kinds of uh, digital um, um, events. We had more than 800 people signing up for these events. We had to really, where we shared uh, the building up of the exhibition. We also had studio visits at the artist. We had discussions, many different uh, things. So, well, thinking of my problems starting this uh, talk, you wouldn't believe it, but we really had a lot of uh, digital new experiences that we bring with us um, into our new future. The art piece, uh, the, the, the opening had to be a digital too because we could not gather the thousand people from all over Denmark who uh, participated. So we made this uh, music video, uh, which you uh, can see just the pictures from, uh, in order to make an experience for people where they could, could kind of get an idea of what they had done. And then over the summer, people, of course, came to visit the museum. For us, this was, uh, we could do this because we have a practice in the museum where we work with big scale collaborative projects. So we know many artists and we also know how to deal it, how to build up a project like this and how to involve people. What is a key when we make these projects? And during my presentations, there will be different pictures from different projects we've done over the years, is that the, the artist makes a framework, but inside the framework, the participants can contribute with something they really are a master. In this case, they could really, they had the chance to show how well they would crochet or how they would experiment with crocheting. So the mastering is 
The form is done by the artist, but the crocheting mastery is by the participants. Um, I'll just see if I can, yeah. Uh, this is, this, with this, I would like to start the discussion about what are museums here for? Uh, and I would also say that this is obvi an obvious thing for us to do because we work with applied art and we actually think applied art that is like being really good at doing a craft in some kind, but many people are good at it, but maybe they're not so good at form. So we need the artist to make the big form. What are museums for? Well, originally museums were made in the 19th century to educate uh, people. And what was educated? Educated meant that we, you learn to know, got knowledge uh, through uh, different displays. This is the old fashioned idea about how to be educated. And of course, today to be educated is not just to know, it is to understand multiple simultaneous perspectives. And we take this very serious at Tarpold. So we do not just transmit knowledge. We work very much on how uh, do we understand the multiple si simultaneous perspectives there are to any issue. We always say we don't give answers, we give questions. Um, but to come into what museums are here for, I would like to introduce an economic way of thinking or looking at museums. So I would, uh, I have used what I call the, the, I have used the Boston matrix, which is kind of a very simple framework to look at museums. And um, in this framework, uh, people talk about the market growth and market share. Uh, you can, if you have a business and museums are businesses, you can look at this this way. Um, if you have, a mu uh, for example, the, the word cash cow down here in the right co uh, down corner is when you have a large market share of something, but low uh, growth and you, it doesn't uh, require a lot of investment. Whereas you can have a shining star up here is when the market is growing, but you also have to invest a lot. Uh, you also have sometimes a low market share with a uh, high demand, but um, low returns. It, this is when you know you have a startup, a new idea where you have to invest a lot, in, but you don't know whether it, you will have any returns. Depends on how the market develops. And also sometimes we have something which is not interesting at all. Uh, there is no market and you don't have any market share. I have used this model on the museum world. Uh, and this is from the perspective of... Uh, an art museum in Denmark, where uh, there has been a lot of focus on that we should uh, earn uh, our own money. We are like considered as if we were in an ivory tower and uh, museums are attractions and we should just make people pay. And if people won't pay for our um, uh, what we deliver, then we're just not performing well enough. That has been, and we have uh, had lowered um, the, uh, support from uh, governmental and uh, municipality funding over the years. This is the situation in Denmark, at least. So if you look at museums from a market perspective, that we are here and we are attractions and we have to generate incomes. If you then look at what we do in the museums, uh, you can use again the word market growth and market share. And if you look at what we, uh, what we have uh, to offer in the museums, uh, you could, for example, look at our stars. Here, the, the star is the special exhibition, which we have to kind of invest a lot in, in order to transmit, uh, classic didactically transmit knowledge to our visitors who are customers. Um, but we also uh, have a cash cow, which is our museum building, the shop, the cafe, where people come and they consume and they spend money, uh, which we need in order to keep the museum going. This is, I'm telling you, this is from the perspective of the economic values in museums. We also, in many museums, at, uh, have what we would call question marks. So outreach projects, engaging with audiences in new ways, participation, school services, the, uh, very often with a constructivist view on how to work as a museum, being uh, involving in dialogue with our surroundings. These, in this model are question marks because in this uh, understanding that museums are attractions that generate income, we have to see these activities as activities in order to create new paying customers. So we will have a school service in order to make children come back with paying parents. 
Uh, and if they don't, don't do that, it is a dog down here and we have to liquidate it. It will not, it doesn't make sense to make all these projects if they don't turn out into paying customers in this perspective. And in this perspective, also collections, at least in Denmark, are not really considered important and research, no, because that doesn't necessarily give uh, more income. Actually, they're just uh, really expensive to keep. Uh, but are these the most important bottom lines? Is the economic bottom line the most important bottom line in museums? I would say in Tapholt, we work with five bottom lines. Of course, we have an economic bottom, bottom line, which is about funding and both public and private funding, uh, which we need in order to run the museum, which is lowered these years. But we also have what we call the visitor bottom line, which is connected to the economic where we make these special exhibitions and uh, we need a ticket income. We need a blockbuster in order to have people to come in. But we also have what we call the collection professional practice bottom line, which is our research, our collection care, our collection develop development. And we also have what we call the civil social professional practice bottom line, which is about being democratic, engaging, empowering, participatory and research. And then we have a fifth bottom line, which is what I call the organizational, or we call it, because if you want to be a museum in a particular way, uh, we would say, then the organization also has to reflect what we communicate. So we need there to be a correspondence between front stage and backstage. We need to have, if we want non-hierarchy in the museum, we need a non-hierarchical organization. And as you can see here in the in the right corner, I just put in some of our projects. I will not come into them; it will take too much time. But uh, you can look into them later if you if you're interested or, or give me questions about them. Um, so, if we dig into the civil social needs in society, uh, the need is well. We could see when the market uh, died in with the lockdown; it was a terrible thing for the for the national economies. But if we look at it. In a, in a larger perspective, we have big uh, challenges in our society in the moment. The political confidence crisis, we have knowledge crisis, we have uh, fake news, we have human crisis, loneliness, stress, depressions, we have a climate crisis, we have migration crisis, we have inequality, growing inequality uh, between people, and we have a need for creativity and learning, and at the latest, the COVID-19. But as I see it, COVID-19 is not the same as the previous ones. The previous ones are structural challenges, whereas COVID-19 is something that came in but was not caused by the structures, but it shows the problems with the structural problems. So uh, addressing this, I would say, from this perspective of this bottom line, the market is growing, if you look here at the left. The market is growing because we have more needs. We have all these challenges that we need to address. So this is a very big need in the society. If you look at the market share, well, the museums can then move into this area. I would say, I would claim that, well, the cash cow is maybe still the building because it is the framework, the architecture where we can perform uh, our uh, projects. But the stars are now outreach projects, engaging with audiences, participation, school services, and constructivist way of working. And I think the wake-up call with the COVID-19, uh, you could see which museums were used to working with uh, audiences, being engaging. Uh, for us, it was not difficult to get the idea to create Light Hope, uh, whereas museums that are mainly with the tourists and uh, have the main focus on generating income and with no focus on civil work had much larger difficulties in uh, knowing how to live uh, in this crisis. I see also, so in this situation, if you look in the left corner, during the COVID-19, definitely the museum shop and the cafe, they had nothing to do. They were closed, they were not uh, important. And from the social uh, society needs, where we have the climate crisis, where we have uh, social crisis, uh, all kinds of crisis, 
these are not the important uh, things to do in museums. Actually, engaging is the star. This is where, in this perspective, where we should um, invest and bring the museums to come. Then I had the question mark, what is the role of the collection and research in this? And I will come back to this in a moment, but I'll just uh, go on to something really radical because uh, the social movement has been in museums for many years. And many of you who are participating in this uh, conference, you are working with civil and social engagement in, uh, in your museums, I presume. And we had a really radical movement coming up here in the latest 10 years with Art Util, uh, with the front figure Tanya Bagheera, uh, who proposed a really radical thinking of museums. Actually, they proposed that uh, we need uses for art within society. Uh, we use artistic thinking to, uh, to go to the current issues that we should discuss. We should replace authors with initiators and spectators with users. So in this perspective, the idea is that people should not go to be entertained in museums. We should use the um, artistic way of thinking to become activists in our society. The, the movement has been strong and uh, you see it in, in, in Holland, you see it in the UK. Uh, and I've been very much inspired by it, though I do find there are some uh, challenges in this very radical way of seeing what museums should be. Because I uh, went to visit MIMA in Middlesbrough, which is one of the front museums who have really, really created, really gone this way to be very activistic and uh, changed their, uh, their um, audiences from being people from coming from all over the UK to see exhibitions to have the same number of visitors, but people being activists in the museum. So I went there last year, but what meant me when I went into the museum was a space like this. And uh, for me, uh, coming and being inspired, this was not an interesting experience to see a room where some other people had had some interesting experiences. Uh, so I was thinking, is the should we, should we leave totally being ordinary museums with collections? And now I'll come back to what the possibilities in our collections hold in my perspective or in my view. They hold a very uh, important no, another discussion, which uh, comes back to what I also addressed, the need uh, to address the problems with loneliness, with stress, anxiety in our society, because uh, art holds some really strong phenomenological uh, um, potentials. For many years, the focus has been on transmitting art history, to transmit information, to transmit economic ideas, how much is the value of this art piece. And if you think about television programs, it's very much about the value, the financial value, how, and is this art or is it not art? But actually, what we need is a discussion about the phenomenological, the experimental, um, potential in museums. Uh, and we did a project a few years ago in Tarpold, uh, Seeing Slowly, it was called Inspired by the book Seeing Slowly, where we invited audiences to sit for three minutes or more. And we, uh, and we have worked with this for many years. People were really, really thoroughly uh, engaged with, with just the invitation. They'd never thought that they should just sit down and uh, relax with the art pieces. Uh, this Seeing slowly is something we work with for many years. We make projects with people who have a stress and anxiety uh, using um, a method we have developed to uh, through different uh, ways of uh, making people sit down and try and feel themselves. And for me, I see as a, a social role of the museums, collections hold an extremely strong uh, potential here if we start using our collection this way, it doesn't need, need to be very expensive. We can do it with our own collections. Uh, we did a race, research program with um, where we had a researcher to follow a two year project uh, with people with stress. And uh, significantly it said, uh, the results say that this works as well or maybe even better than if you'd use mindfulness. And um, so I'll just um, say that the social potential for uh, museums is not only for activism, but also for using our collections in this kind of ways. 
So if you look at the two models I suggested, museums seen as attractions, financial, uh, the financial view, or museums seen as at the civil social bottom line. How do they work together? Because the reality is, honestly, we really need to earn some money because we have lower uh, public funding. And also when we get private funding, we need to very often the private foundations, they want to support uh, big extravagant uh, exhibitions. So it's very much uh, on the economic bottom line that, uh, that we, are, we need to take that with us, though many of us really believe in the uh, civic and social bottom line. So this has to work together somehow. So how can we make this work? Uh, my suggestion is that uh, we need to look at the organizational bottom line of museums because the way we are organized needs to be different. And I think the COVID-19 is a wake up call for the sector. What we need is equality between uh, collection management, civil social work uh, in museums and exhibitions, of course, I forgot to write that. Um, we really need to have non-hierarchical uh, organizations and we need management in large museums, not just small museums, but large museums to thoroughly believe in it, to lead the way, to think of the civil social agenda, which I think is definitely, I will put it up again and emphasize here, up, I see this as the leading star of museums. Uh, we really need that to be the, the management and the organization to change. We need not to have those hierarchies between uh, collection management, exhibitions, and civil social work. We need those things to come together in projects where they support each other instead of fighting each other in different sectors of museums. And we need to make research and valid data to uh, knowledge share and to communicate this message. And we also need our funding partners, the government, the municipality and the private foundations to look for uh, organizations that work this sustainable way uh, instead of having different sectors in museums fighting because we all have too little finances. So we're all uh, uh, fighting to get um, the money in and the attention in the organization and we need the civil social agenda not to be a department but to be integrated and we need to learn from this and to change our organizations from this learning um just my final note uh, or my final comment is that um you could see i had different examples from projects in the tapholt uh, we, uh, I'll just mention a few of them to give you an impression. We made this amazing project in 2016 where Syrians cooked and Danes brought porcelain they wanted to throw away and they ate from the porcelain, the Syrians made the food and we made this amazing art piece called Waste Time with Enya Franke. Uh, this year we uh, showed this amazing art piece made by Asus Berger Fix where 311 woodturners had created this art piece together with him. Um, we made in 2015-16 uh, the Monument of Stitches where uh, 650 participants from six towns knitted uh, buildings to each other that were at, fir at the first shown at the town square and later put together a tripod. Oh, Again, all these art pieces are uh, core pieces in the tripod collection. We um, did... Oh, oops. I came out of my presentation, here it is. And for the um, celebration of the century, centenary of the reunification of Denmark, uh, getting south of Denmark back to Denmark, uh, we uh, thought, uh, talking about borders, what are borders? We had um, 800 people knitting an art piece together with the artist Iben Hoy. This art piece is, again, a key art piece in the top art collection. It is a beautiful art piece because the form was done by Iben Hoy, but the participants, they could contribute with their stitch, their subject, under the, the regulations of what kind of thread and what kind of cloth they could um, embroidery do their embroidery on. Uh, and I'm very proud to tell you that uh, yesterday we received a mail from the Danish Art Council 
who has given this art piece uh, a prize as an, art, an outstanding art piece created this year. So she won the prize of the Danish Art Council, which we are very proud of. For me, this uh, supports um, my um, my idea. My is that uh, we should, as museums, reorganize. We need new kinds of management. Many of you who work with the civil and social agenda in museums, uh, we sh you should start consider, maybe you should become the new directors so that directors, we have different kinds of directors in museums, not only directors with an art historian background, but also some directors with a civil social background and of course, art historical knowledge, but, uh, but, uh, but with this kind of agenda, instead of only having one kind of directors because the director will, of course, lead the way and create the organization. Yes. So this was uh, the words and my uh, suggestions uh, for the future of museums. And uh, thank you for listening. Fascinating. We're getting lots of interested feedback on the chat here. People saying they found that very inspiring. I was wondering, what are you going to do with the artwork afterwards? I mean, does it is it now a part of your collection? Is it something... Um, is it important in its own right? I guess that's the question. Well, it is really, really important for us that it was a collaborative project. It was an art piece. So it has to be an art piece in its own right. And uh, I have to say it's really, uh, it's a very long process with the artist. It takes a lot also, uh, they have to be interested in working with the curator, discussing how can this be interesting for the participants and how can this become an art piece but it has to end up as a genuine art piece that goes into our collection and we do uh, show these art pieces now and then we take them up frequently we are very proud of them they are really amazing the Thingstead project with the wood turners it's like you know I way way couldn't have done it better <laughs> uh, so, so it's like it's really a very impressive art pieces okay we're getting a lot of comments on the chat saying how inspiring how interesting I'm waiting for some questions. So if any of you do have any questions for Karen, please plug them in now. Um, the other thing you mentioned, the organizational change that needs to happen, this bottom mm. up idea and the a whole new generation of, um, of museum directors with different approaches, different ideas. Mm. How can that happen? Yes, how can that happen? Well, I think, uh, it, there has to be two things, uh, many things happening, but two very important things is that uh, the boards at the museums have to understand this. The, the funding partners have to understand and ask for it. Because if they keep supporting the old fashioned kind of museum, then that is how museums will keep having directors and keep developing. But the other thing is we need the people working in the field to get the ambition. And I have to admit, for myself, I was the curator of um, audience development, and I never thought I would be a director. I, I remember when they approached me and asked me, I laughed at it. I said, that's the most stupid thing I ever heard. Uh, so it was a very long process for me to understand that maybe this was a good idea. Uh, it was a long journey. And uh, it also actually, after I became director, I had to kind of get get used to this uh, situation. Now, I really after a few years, I really understood I had the keys. I can do the change. Uh, I have the I have the possibility to make a totally different kind of museum. So for me, it was a journey, and I think for many of the people uh, participating in this conference, because I understood, I asked who are the participants, and I'm a bit curious: are there any directors joining this conference? Are they into this agenda? Uh, uh, so I would that would be a question for me: Are you there, or is it only the people who work with social and civil subjects in museums? Because then it's very difficult to to climb the ladder. Um, but you need to get the ambition and understand that you hold the key for the future museums. And it doesn't mean that you don't make a great ex a museum. Actually, after the COVID-19, when we opened, we I think we were one of the only museums with a lot of visitors uh, from the very beginning. When we opened the doors, we had the same amount of visitors as last year. And uh, then we had a boom over the summer because the government made a package where they supported it. All museums had that. But it actually, and then I thought August would be weak, but they kept coming. So, so this means that you become the museum of your of your um, constituency or whatever, of your surroundings. We're getting, 
We're getting lots of questions as, um, coming in now. Um, let me, they keep on scrolling up and I can't see them all at once. But there's one here from, um, yes, that was the one. Uh, Mari Vasani asks, um, she says she loves the collaborative art pieces. I wonder though, all of these art forms seem so Western, crocheting, knitting, etc. Mm -hmm. But you did also mention your Syrian cooking with the porcelain. Mm -hmm. I guess, do, what other examples do you have? What other cultures, art forms? Is this a, a question that you would... Yeah, that's a very good question. Now, Denmark is a very uniform country with a very few um, kind of... Uh, it's a very uniform country. So uh, I have looked more into social classes uh, than into a different, um, necessarily uh, different uh, ethnicities in the, in the country. Uh, we we had it was very interesting with the Syrians, uh, but uh, and with the with the embroidery we tried to include uh, what we call the language schools because we would really have liked to have some people, uh, some who are refugees and who come from other countries to Denmark, but they did not have the actually they pulled out because they didn't have uh, the resources to participate in the projects. And then we tried to invite people, but they, um, but they, they it didn't work. So that was a sad story about how uh, the resources in the public uh, means that it's difficult to work with different groups. Yeah, I hope that was a question and there was a reply, but we also have to understand, uh, so, so um, I look very much into how do we integrate many different social levels uh, at the museum. Let's look at Maria Bruce's question too. Um, what is your experience with the audience to most efficiently reach them by social media and so on? That must have been important with your with your crocheting. <laughs> how, how did you get everyone involved? What was the best? Yeah. Well, we found that yeah, we found that Facebook. Uh, over the years, we have become better and better, and we have uh, over the last years used Facebook to uh, gather people with the wood turners. Uh, the men, they were not uh, using Facebook as much as um, as the women are. Apparently, we we found. So with the wood turners, it is mainly uh, through emailing and then gathering to them together. They want to be present uh, as a person. So we had to gather them uh, in groups uh, in order for them to um, to wait uh, to, uh, to to have conversations. Uh, with the crocheting and the embroidery, we have had some really large Facebook groups. And I have to say, with the crocheting, it was a big surprise to us because it totally exploded. We had not, uh, we we'd not, we didn't think it would be that strong, but it became a place where people could share their concerns and their ideas about COVID-19. And we also asked them to share the crocheting. And also when they delivered their crocheting, uh, the light bulb. We asked them to share their positive thoughts about what they learned from um, from the uh, lockdown, and they also shared this on the Facebook, where they also shared uh, needles, uh, crochet needles, and yarn, and they started to make light bulb earrings and uh, did all kinds of things. Made new communities in this, uh, so that was very strong. And then we used Zoom for our big events because with this I could bring 800 people together. And then I could uh, send them out in uh, crocheting groups. So a person from the Faroe Islands could crochet with two, three other people from Denmark. Uh, so they could sit and do crocheting and, and talk a bit and then get together. So we could use Zoom for that. Okay, Michael Jone, another question here. Um, what structural organizational changes have you implemented? Just as an example for... Yes, yes. Um, uh, I uh, when I became director, it was uh, I said I will uh, I will do it, but I will. Uh, but we have to tear down the walls inside the house. So the director's office became uh, an office where everybody sit. And I said that uh, I could not have the title curator in the house because uh, we had uh, we had of course people working like, um, but but we could not have the title because there was so much hierarchy and power in this title. So for many years, until a few years ago, we didn't have the title curator at Trafford at all. 
we had only a team structure and people were then collection responsible, audience responsible. That's what were the terms. Uh, and it took a while for me to create this organization. And also some people in who had to leave again because maybe they were appointed to be collection uh, responsible, but they wanted to be, they started to make uh, hierarchies. So it has, to, it has been a very long journey for me to create this uh, group, this team. Well, and some of the problems doing this was, one of the problems was that if you do something really radical different, then the, the outer world, it's difficult for them to understand who you are. So when people were appointing for a job, they were like, uh, yes, but uh, I'm collection management, but actually I'm curator, because that's what I learned at the other museum. So they would install the old hierarchies when they came in. So, uh, but of course the wonderful people I have now, they understand the idea. But also I found that the people working in the museum until a few years ago, they had difficulty in telling other people what they were doing in the museum. It was this hippie team working uh, museum. Uh, and uh, sometime you know, uh, our chief of uh, uh, exhibitions, she's above me and directs, and sometimes I direct, so who's responsible for what? But so we, but also it was because it was so difficult for them to tell other people what their work was. We could reintroduce the term curator, which they had been doing all the time, uh, because now we had uh, stabilized. But I have to say it was a long journey. Uh, but now it means that during the COVID-19, uh, the team got together and it was like this, and it all changed into fitting into the new situation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen. I think we're going to have to stop there. After the break, we're going to hear more about museum, democracy and education. I would suggest to start with Andre Wilkins. Andre, may I ask you just to give your um, view from the perspective of the European Cultural Foundation to our question? So basically, naturally, as a European Foundation, we look at the whole issue of museums and social responsibility um, through a European lens. Um, from this perspective, I, we as the European Cultural Foundation consider museums an essential part of a, of a nascent but developing European public sphere, a European public space. So museums can and they do create a European experience, they can and they do tell European stories. COVID-19 um, for us is a reminder of this very important role of museums in Europe, but also of of the stimulus and opportunity for new thinking and change. This is not only about uh, COVID, but uh, rather the current situation amplifies other challenges to museums, like the digital challenge, the challenge um, of the colonial heritage, the challenge of diversity, the challenge of uh, over -commercial commercialization, um, over tourism, and the challenge of sustainability and climate change. COVID um, brought a rather abrupt opportunity to this challenge and to challenge our concept of cultural experience and being creative and finding new ways, even playful ways, um, with which we provide a safe and stimulating experience, a European experience and foster European sentiment. But this lens um, is uh, but the lens of um, museums and curators is still rather national. Um, also, that is uh, also changing. Um, but how we tell the story of Europe through art, through objects, through senses will have a big implication on Europe's future. And museums have a great opportunity and responsibility here. Um, the Venice Biennale for us is a point um, in case, it's, it's an example, it is still dominated by rather national and outdated approaches and uh, COVID-19 has also, like to the whole um, um, museum world, uh, created a pause and um, this pause uh, should be used creatively, we believe, 
um, not simply by doing more of the same thing, but now let's do it in a digital uh, way. And we saw that uh, this has also um, some problems, but by revisiting um, the whole concept, this is why we are working on a concept of a, of a European pavilion, or in fact, of many European pavilions. And we consider uh, the European pavilion idea as an example um, of how to deal creatively with this um, situation. Challenge turn it into an opportunity for European um, public space. So that would be my initial um, input. And I hope uh, we can discuss um, further on this, but also the other um, challenges and opportunities. I, I very much uh, look at the opportunity side of museums and social responsibility in these times. Andre, uh, please let's just go on uh, and, and speak a little bit about this. Let's start with COVID-19. So um, what what is your impression? How did and how are museums coping with this pandemic, with this problem? Um, uh, there were there were and there are numerous digital offerings. Did you look at something? And if so, what was it? Uh, what, imp what impressed you? What are your experiences? So I I, I think um, uh, like with with um, a lot in the in the cultural field, um, um, there was a lot of resilience and a lot of creativity in dealing with this situation looking specifically not only at the own institutions, but at the, uh, as, at the visitors, at the, how can we create a cultural experience in this new context, which is probably not only, and we know that it is not only a question of a few weeks or maybe two or three months, that it will be with us for some time. And um, I'm, I'm sitting here in Amsterdam, so um, the museums there have been really at the forefront of reconnecting with visitors and trying to build new programs in the digital field but not only because that that, that, that is not where the museums will be they will not be just um, um, migrate to the digital space um, and I know it is very difficult to deal with uh, all the restrictions you have with social distancing with a uh, new hygiene concepts but they are doing it because um, you know they want to stay open and and i think that's uh, that's a very valuable approach even if it is difficult also for the visitor themselves um and um, i can only encourage everyone despite the difficulties uh, go back to the museums um and um and um and help um help the museums to to find their new way in these times and as i uh, mentioned in my introductory remarks um it's not only that you have now time it's uh, a lot of um, challenges which the museums had already before are amplified now and and um we will have to deal with this too i mean the whole debate on black lives matter and uh, decolonialization is, is a big thing and, and, and that will not uh, go away, that will stay with us and that is a creative challenge. And so um, uh, I encourage my colleagues um, to, to think the, these challenges together and, and, and in a way see it as a, as a creative opportunity and I know how hard that sometimes sounds um, when, when you have to pay the bills and um, um and so on but um but that is the same for all of us um also in the in the philanthropic sector and um but um but um i i hope that is will be the legacy of of covid 19 that that has um paused us and it has uh, forced us to find um, new ways and better ways than we had before Thank you very much, Andre. We will continue at this point um, later. So, Stefan, please, would you give us your impulse? Yes. Um, well, I, I don't know whether maybe I should jump into the digitalization question you were just discussing. So, um, the PwC Foundation is actually has started with digitalization of its own projects in 2019, and this year we are actually creating a um, virtual gallery 
and which will all end a virtual concert hall for pupils, which is our main target group, to be able to practically and um, participatorily um, create works of art um, under the guidance of professionals. So the COVID-19 crisis has led us to take it as a chance, a chance to enhance, enhance the digital possibilities. And uh, I think generally we face um, five complexes, complex divisions of society, which are actually uh, pushing museums forward in the direction of social responsibility. I don't know whether you have already discussed it, but this is the age-related division, uh, the gap between young and old, the digital division between those digital natives and those who are not really keen on digital uh, tools, the social division of society, the gap between rich and poor, and the social cultural division of society, and last not least, the urban suburban division. So these actually shifts the focus also of cultural institutions on target groups to focus on young people, the topic of digitalization, the precarity, the diversity. So it's not only that our European culture stands in the focus of whole of society. Some museums uh, have the task to get new audiences and new visitors. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, but so if we want to come back to our questions, once again, foundations and museums, Andre, also the question to you, what can museums do? What can foundations not do? Right. And what is the appropriate complementary? So um, how can we can we support each other? But um, what do you um, which possibilities do you see for museum? What foundation cannot provide, not deliver. So, Stefan, well, perhaps. Uh, yeah. Thank you. At first, I would say there are synergies. So, so there are it's not so much a question what the one institution can do and the others cannot. I think, especially in the field of digitalization, there's a lot to be done together. For example, these digital spaces which can be created. I think there has to be a spirit, and um, Dominica, we have talked about it earlier, that foundations and museums are more and more open to collaboration, to participations and to synergies. So what is what museums, what foundations cannot do? Okay, they usually do not provide collections. They do not have artworks whatsoever. But in the ideal case, they have the money to um, uh, help museums to get, for example, their virtual um, halls to uh, digitalize their uh, pieces of art and so on, so that um, much more people can visit the museum, even if not going there physically, but on a virtual, uh, in a virtual sphere. And the museums mostly lack the money if they are not privately funded uh, by, by some companies or, or um, <clears throat> prominent persons. So they uh, um, are relying on some extra funding. And I'm very happy that um, the what has been there in former years, that there was some hesitation according or with, re with regards to the collaboration with companies or with uh, company-related foundations. So there was the, the fear that they would sort of take over uh, and then maybe push forward uh, this collaboration as a sort of marketing thing. I don't. I, I think that this has a bit uh, slow, uh, smooth down this uh, this fear. I think it's not that prominent anymore, but it's still somehow there. And this is uh, what the foundations have to deal with. So I think it's important that it's a collaboration on the uh, the same level. Yeah, that really both institutions look okay. What do we? gain not in a way of profit but ideally where can we really find um, um, points to collaborate and to have synergies thank you andre yeah i um whether it's complementary or not to what what you just said i uh, we will see afterwards i i think actually the museums uh, they are the ones who uh, who make things happen they are the ones at the forefront. They are the what I would describe the public space. They are in the city centers. They are everywhere. Um, uh, th these are the the, the players um, which I, I find uh, consider essential 
similar actually also to libraries um, in, in many ways. Um, so what can foundations do? They, they, are, um, they can help. They can, for example, help um, to deal with these new challenges, whether it's digitalization, as you said, or whether that's the question of Black Lives Matter uh, decolonization, because that is a process. And as an institution, often kick-starting a new process is difficult, and you might want to have a partner with you who can provide money, but not only money, also expertise, um, networks, um, collaborations. That's where I see the role of um, of foundations um, as um, someone to help in a change process. Thank you. Um, we have yes, yeah, Stefan. Yes, uh, I just wanted to add something to what Andres said. And it's true that uh, in many times the people who are working in the museums, they are really very creative and uh, looking for new, um, uh, new formats of uh, presenting artwork. But on the other hand, sometimes uh, they can also be a bit, um, naja, let's say um, slow, that because they are so most of the time restricted with the funds they have, sometimes it restricts also the mind. Whereas foundations sometimes also have very creative persons working there. So they are developing new formats. And I think the, the good thing would be to combine these, these two spirits. Yeah, in the best case, there is a very creative and dynamic museum meeting a creative and dynamic foundation. And then new projects can be um, launched. Stefan, perfect. Thank you very much. So I have a question for you from Natalia. How we may reach you to check if there may be any support for an innovative museum project? <laughs> you can reach me via PWC um, minus Stiftung, the German word for foundation, uh, dot DE. They will Thank find you. our website. <laughs> Thank you very much. And also a question for Andre. Do you know Nord Metal Foundation in Hamburg? They are a great partner for us and offer wonderful support to stimulate change in order to open up and become more relevant museums. Mm -hmm. So yeah, can you, can you tell good. us something about it? I mean, is it, um, is it the best case uh, for, a, for a cooperation or... Um, I didn't totally understand. Do you talk about a specific case in Hamburg? Yes, I, I, about the North was Metall, interested. which was mentioned here right now, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, we are, as a foundation, all into uh, corporations with, with others. We cooperate a lot with foundations in Italy at the moment, um, but also with Dutch foundation, German foundations. So if there is a, is a great idea, is a great project, but we look at it, as I said in the beginning, through a European lens. And, um, and there is a, is a big opportunity, but there's also a big challenge, especially now where, you know, borders are closed, um, travel is restricted uh, in many ways. Um, what used to be a, a very vibrant cultural exchange at the moment is, is reduced to the max uh, um, in, in that sense. So how to restart this, this is, is not easy. And um, whoever has a great idea um, and wants to work with us on, on, on restarting a European public space through the museum landscape, uh, please, um, please come to us and, and help us. And we, we're very willing and open to work on that. And as I mentioned, this uh, idea we're developing with many um, curators um, and museums and, and partners, also foundation partners of a European pavilion, um, that is for us a contribution to this um, um, kick-starting uh, or re reviving a European public sphere through a, a new kind of model. Thank you. So. Um... Before, um, well, pr preparing this, um, this, this conference, these sessions, we talked a lot about the work of museums and what is necessary to involve people. And uh, we had the term of the participation, right, Stefan? Mm -hmm. We talked a lot about it. So participation is a very, um, a very uh, important point of us. And um, I have a question which fits right well. Um, now it disappeared. 
Oh, yes, here it is. So um, from York, UK, we have a very contemporary sector too and the university and a hub of gaming design. What do speakers think about museums and development of gaming technologies? So, I mean, there are meanwhile a lot of museums dealing with gaming, with, with games, establishing or yeah, um, preparing games for, for their visitors, for children, but, uh, but also for adults. Um, the ZKM, for example, is collecting games since um, 1989, so for a very long time right now. So the games are a part of our culture. How do you see this point? Well, I think for us, that is a new field. Uh, we are still, let's say, in the traditional field that um, young visitors of museums create uh, catalogues, virtual catalogues or virtual guidance tours in the respective museums. So the combination with, with gaming is, I think, very interesting, but we have not had it so far. Uh, so it would be up to the precise projects which may be um, confronting us um, to see more about it. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, I think there, is, uh, there are fascinating possibilities, but uh, we, from our side, have not yet any experience with gaming and museums. André. It's, uh, it's a bit similar with us. Um, we are, in a way, open. We don't... Um, um, restrict to any particular art form in, in a way. Um, we hope to create a European sentiment, a European sense of belonging. So whatever works, and of course, whatever um, works in order to reach um, diverse audiences, diverse uh, visitor groups. So And, and there is a problem, um, which uh, um, um, Stefan has uh, started to address also in the generational um, way of um, um, working with museums. So, um, you know, gaming, um, um, pop culture in general um, are very interesting and um, um, important areas. We don't have ourselves, also we want to, we, we don't have um, so much experience. Maybe they, um, um, we, we don't we are not considered a partner in this we have tried to go into this area of pop culture it's it's not uh, it's not so easy but I, I think it's important also in in the context of how do you reach audiences which are currently not reached it's a question of accessibility of museum it's not accessibility accessibility but uh, you know accessibility in um, the kind of exhibits and, and concepts you have. And there's um, um, a lot of work still to be done, which I think is happening. But um, when it comes to, to gaming and, and pop culture in general, I, we haven't had uh, so much experience, but here we are, we are, we are open. Uh, so, um, and um, we are very interested in it. Stefan, I saw your sign, but I have to yeah. add something. Right yeah. now, we are speaking about the point of audience development, right? And um, the European Union was one of the first programs who um, started to support this idea of audience development, right? So the first programs of the European Union were um, driven by content. So um, museums uh, could just apply for, for an exhibition, for the support of an exhibition. And some years ago, um, the EU started uh, to give the possibility also for a department of marketing just to suggest a concept how to how to address the public right so how to try to gain new audience we for example had a wonderful project smart uh, called smart places for four years right now where eight museums uh, from all over the europe uh, just focus on the point how can we get people into the museums and there was also a point of gaming included mm -hmm. so it's really a very important point for us um just the gamification aspect stefan <clears throat> thank you um, I wanted to stress that our foundation focuses on the uh, practical input from, for example, young people. So uh, I just came to my mind one project which we had that they were um, creating actually robots which were making music. So there is a gaming approach, if you like, yeah, because uh, especially little kids or also older kids and 
sometimes even old white men um, are interested in robots and in this kind of techniques. And the collection of these robots from this project is currently shown at the Deutsches Museum in Munich. Uh, so it's really interesting that here this project with little children is now has now found its way to a museum. And this gaming approach is that the kids really have fun, you know, doing something aesthetically, creatively created themselves. And this is what we what we like to promote. Hmm. Wonderful, yeah. And uh, just to add something to the game culture, oh, I've seen Catherine. Catherine, give me a sign if we are over time <laughs> uh, because of the new schedule. Um, just to add something to the games culture. Um, I mean, Andre, you talk about games and pop culture. Meanwhile, um, there are a lot of um, games which are very um, critical which are very critical, which are very political. Um, it's, um, well, it's not the main production, right? No, not the, the, the consumer side of, of the gaming. But uh, I just uh, invite you to the ZKM to visit uh, our exhibition mm. gameplay. So there you have a huge variety of really a lot of aspects of gaming today right now. And I think this is a very, um, very important point for mm -hmm. culture. For our next panel, we're going to Italy, and this one's on community involvement. The panel is led by Margarita Sani, who is in charge of international museum projects at the Institute of Cultural Heritage in the Italian region of Emilia Romagna. She's designed and managed many EU funded projects in the fields of museum education, lifelong learning and intercultural dialogue. She's been on the executive board of NEMO since 2014, has been on the jury of the Children and Museums Award, and since 2019 on the steering committee of Europeana Education. She will introduce her two panel members, and here she is. Hello, Margarita. All right. Okay. Good afternoon then, everyone. Um, happy to be back. Um, so in this session, we are going to address the, the topic of community involvement. And just the other day, I was speaking to a group of students about museums and communities. And um, of course, the, the question came from them. Um, what is a community? What do you mean by community? And, and indeed, the word community has many connotations. If we look at the current literature on museums, we uh, read that there are uh, source communities or communities of origin, and they are the ones from which the collections originate. We have, of course, the user communi communities, the visitors to a site or a museum. We have the interpretive communities, who are the ones who actively contribute to uh, the interpretation process. And, um, and then we have the communities of practice uh, or of interest, those who share uh, skills or ideas, exchange know-how. And then very importantly, we have the heritage community, which is defined, uh, the term was coined by the uh, FARO Convention, and defined as people who value specific aspects of cultural heritage, which they wish within the framework of public action to sustain and transmit to future generations. All of these communities uh, seem also to, also to merge in another kind of community, which is the virtual or online community. And um, especially with um, the Web 2.0 and user-generated content and the digital participation that museums can elicit from, from people, these communities seem to sort of like take them all. So uh, very interesting, inter interestingly, um, the mention of place or territory is not, does not appear uh, in, in the heritage community 
definition of the FARO Convention. And also, of course, there is no, um, no definition in terms of space in the virtual community. So the, the, the uh, association between community and, and geography and location seem to have disappeared. What does it mean? Why am I saying this? Because when we're talking about community involvement, the first question is, which communities are we talking about? And of course, why leaving it to each museum to define its own community or its own target groups, which could be many and not necessarily in the neighborhood. Uh, I would like to introduce the speakers of this afternoon that will help me explore the subject. And first of all, uh, Sara Brigenti from Portugal, who is Deputy Commissioner uh, of the National Arts Plan and member of the Project Group Museums in the Future commissioned by the Portuguese government. You should know that the, gov uh, the government in Portugal has commissioned a very important study, a national report, which was uh, completed not too long ago, um, and which identifies the uh, priorities and the uh, actions for the next uh, 10 years. So it's, an ex it's a 10-year plan, which also includes many, uh, many indications as far as um, working with communities. Um, Sara was also director of the Museum of Money uh, uh, of the Bank of Portugal and uh, previously also worked as cultural and education programmer and as advisor for art museums, exhibition centers, theaters and various institutions. So, uh, I would uh, uh, now um, give the floor to you, Sara, uh, thinking that you are, for the moment, the only other person on the panel. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to this um, NEMO uh, conference. I'm really glad to be here debating such an important uh, theme. Thank you, Margarita, for your presentation. I'm, I'm and sure my that question, Matthew... right? And my question is coming now that I know that it's just me and you for the moment. Um, yeah. So the first question is, um, why do you think it is important for museums to, to work closely with communities and, 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 and how? Can this be done? I'm sure that what strategies should be put into place, and, and I'm sure you've explored this uh, with your working group on the future of museums in Portugal. So um, I will just start to say that uh, this um, project group for the future of museums in Portugal um, aimed at identify factors of change that could, get, uh, could have an impact on museums and monuments in Portugal by 2030. This report uh, focused on a dual perspective, uh, analysis and strategy, and incorporated different voices with complement, which complemented each other with the data collected. The result is a report with 50 recommendations that are organized into five thematic axes, like uh, museum management, networks and part partnerships, digital transformation, collection management, audience development and mediation. And to go specifically uh, on the theme uh, community involvement, I can sum up uh, some of these recommendations like uh, helping museums um, compromises and action plans that will promote social impact. Um, or to enlarge and diverse uh, opening hours of museums in order to ensure uh, their adaptations to audience profiles, uh, location and seasonality. Uh, or uh, a very important recommenda recommendations towards the um, link between uh, culture and the Ministry of Education uh, in order to emphasize the value of museums, heritage, Arts as active components of the school mandatory curricula. Uh, making available uh, digital resources for all uh, educators and teachers and so on. So 
Conversations will serve as a strategic roadmap towards the future, and we will uh, address them um, and this topic closely in the Lisbon conference next year. But uh, to go briefly into the questions posed, why is it important for museums to work closely with the communities they serve? I wish to underline that um, something that has been previously said, that the work of museums do uh, with communities is part of their civil social mission. In each territory, this work is carried out in different ways by different institutions. And this means that if museums fulfill their social role, their impact is evident within the community. Thus, if we look at museums as part of this broad ecosystem of services, essential for the well-being of a community and the functioning of a territory, we realize that social commitment of the museum is crucial to the functioning of the whole. Lately, uh, the pandemic has given high visibility to health services and the way they are organized and respond to people's needs. But it also shown to other services like museums that can save us at other levels. In fact, museums that have been able to communicate effectively and take an opportunity to gain the public's attention on digital platforms have also proved to be useful and available and answered the question that must be asked by all bodies serving society. The question is uh, exactly how can I help? Um, the answer to this question was, in many cases, the motto for the creation of a strategy that had to be developed and implemented in the immediate term. To be solutions, museums had to be aware of their present and give feedback to the needs of people and institutions they work for in each community and territory, organizing themselves into shared leaderships, networks, with local mediators. This has been part of a great movement of change where museums have had to take risks, forget business as usual, in order to provide a concrete response at the right time. Museums had to establish priorities while maintaining availability and openness. At a time of crisis with so many challenges, I believe that the relevant response to community involvement is the ability to, the ability to focus locally, to listen, to trust, decide, and finally to act. And by pointing out where it is crucial to interview professionals and voluntary, voluntary social cultural mediators, will for sure be able to bridge the gap between museums, territories and their communities. The path to this complex task lies beyond uh, empathy, emotional intelligence and creativity. In fact, this needs a major investment in team building and recruiting with comprehensive view of people from diverse backgrounds and perspectives. And finally, I would say that museums' actions towards community involvement demand to go deep. And by deep, I mean the acronym for diversity, inclusion and participation. And these are actually three directions for a sustainable multidisciplinary approach to community engagement. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, I think I can uh, continue with you, uh, and, okay. and I would, I would ask you also, um, since you have been a, a museum professional. I mean, you have worked in a museum. You have uh, direct. You, you were wow. director in a museum, and and and. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that uh, this emphasis on emphasis on communities on the audience on the public uh, changes the nature uh, in in a, in a way that museum the museum is trying to stretch itself too far is it changing the nature of the museum and and also the nature of of the profession so i would ask you mm -hmm. this question from the point of view of the professional because you just mentioned the recruiting the mm -hmm. um, the, the the role of the mediator of the broker which is indeed what one uh, thinks is crucial when when you when you address communities 
in in a in an authentic uh, genuine way not just doing rhetoric but uh, really yeah. engaging them yeah yeah uh, well, um, I, I think it's for sure the, uh, a call for change, uh, what is all happening and um, the, the times we are living. So uh, the, I think the big change is actually to put uh, the focus on uh, a people-centered uh, perspective. And this will imply that museums have to take a stand and um, they need to be more diverse. They need to work more with education and mediation and uh, with programming, uh, calling up um, different voices in the museum. And by this, they will um, go beyond words and they will be able to manifest um, their mission in concrete actions, not rhetoric, as you and uh, projects that will have impact on people's lives. So right. I definitely uh, uh, agree with you that museums need to put human values and rights at the center of a culture and heritage. Thank you so much, Sarah. And uh, we would now like to welcome Matthias Kruden, um, who is Director of Democratic Participation at the Council of Europe, and uh, the, um, which includes uh, Council of Europe activities and programs in the area of education, education for democratic citizenship, youth cooperation, culture, and cultural heritage landscape and biodiversity. You're keeping all this together, Matthias, quite a challenge. So you are the, the best person entitled to tell us why you think that museums should work with communities uh, which uh, democratic uh, and social community values they should be promoters of. I leave it uh, uh, up to you to to develop these. Okay. Uh, thank you. Things. Thank you very much, uh, Margarita. And hi, Sarah. And I apologize for uh -huh. all. I hope my skills in um, working on democratic participation are better than my technical <laughs> skills. Of course. Um, <laughs> were the reason that I was not being able to also follow your discussion. Um, the, um, you already introduced me, present, uh, mentioned what I'm, what I'm responsible for. Uh, for the sake of um, full disclosure, I'm also um, a lawyer. And as much as I'm uh, tempted to uh, give you um, a lecture about the business of uh, um, professional museums to a virtual room full of museum professionals, I will restrict <laughs> myself um, to 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 say why um, um, this is important for the Council of Europe, and I think it will be answering the questions you're mentioning about why we think the that social responsibility of museums are important for from the point of view of the of the mission of the organization such as the Council of Europe, which was set up to to promote uh, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Um, to short points because i'm sure we are short of time already uh, the first one uh, is historical um and it's um this year we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of the european convention of human rights now what is not and the creation of the court of human rights what is perhaps less known that the first major convention that the council of europe created after 1950 and the european convention of human rights was the european cultural convention and it was European Cultural Convention, which is the basis for cooperation in the areas of education, history, cultural heritage, and so on. And it was the deliberate political decision of the founders of the European project, if you want, because they understood that the European community, Europe as a community of values and institutions will not be able to function without an investment and nurturing and cultivating of an environment through culture, through history, through education. You can uh, see how important role the uh, museums would have in that cultivation of that environment uh, in, which, in which European institutions and Europe as a community can, can, can prosper. And Europe as a community is, of course, only one of the communities that museums uh, would serve and, and, and support. Uh, the second point is more contemporary, but it's also an illustration of that importance. What we are seeing in the recent times in Europe and elsewhere, unfortunately, 
are certain tendencies um, that I would um, describe in three ways. First of all, what we can see is we can see an assault on knowledge, on knowledge, on um, science, on facts. Um, secondly, we see attempts to manipulate, distort, politicize history. And thirdly, we see attempts to uh, manipulate, even weaponize the notion of culture for political purposes in order to undermine the certain, I would say, civilizational foundations that we have had in Europe as the basis of our, our coexistence since the Second World War. Again, in response to that, tendencies and developments, I think the role of museums, of places, of access to knowledge, of, 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 of access to, to um, history, culture, heritage, are extremely important. Um, I'm not uh, trying to say that museums in this respect should be some sort of ideological activists, but they certainly, I think, are a very, very important part of our immunity system, of our social immunity system against attempts that for political reasons, for reasons that are contrary to the values that uh, uh, we have built uh, Europe upon, um, 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 we, would, we, would, we would tolerate and we would be helpless to this kind of developments. I'll stop here because I'm sure I will go a little too long. Right. Well, in fact, uh, what you're saying um, reminds us that there were two very interesting sessions in the morning both on uh, topics very, very close to what you just said. One, museums must promote the democracy, what? Uh, from the Finnish mm -hmm. museums and museum education uh, in political awareness. So this role that you say maybe museums should not, indeed it's already been embraced or should not only, or maybe they're not the, the only actors in this field, but um, they are certainly very important actors which have embraced uh, that uh, that uh, challenge already and and are doing that. Um, I would like you to ask you um, with regard to the Faro Convention, which was mentioned at the beginning of the session, and uh, the important importance it had to to bring the notion of heritage community to the fore. Uh, if you have, from your observatory of the Council of Europe, if you have evidence that this has stimulated uh, cultural uh, heritage organizations to um, to work more with the with their communities. Well, I think I think we do. And as I said before, uh, when I was talking about Europe, it being only one of the communities um, um, that that come into into. Um, 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 that are relevant in the, in the respect of that, dis of that discussion today in the relationship between museums and communities. The FARO Convention really was meant to um, 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 use cultural heritage, including, of course, museum being an important um, a medium and, and, and part of that process, as, as a way to um, both um, stimulate and, and, and motivate um, the uh, community building around the cultural heritage, and secondly, uh, involve democratize governance of cultural heritage um, through through the participation of the of the community. And I think we certainly certainly have evidence of of of, of both, where the um, uh, cultural heritage, which in the Faro Convention is defined as whatever in a way people consider to be their heritage, has led to the has led to the. Um, 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 very important, positive, uh, social, um, but also economic developments um, in, in, in certain areas where the, around the, 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 the notion of culture, cultural heritage, um, through the principles of the FARO Convention, uh, you've had, um, uh, you provided an opportunity for people to, to basically, to, to form a community, to interact, to participate in governance and to draw benefits, uh, as I said again, social, uh, economic, and other ones uh, from that. So it's clearly, clearly uh, something that works very well for the uh, communities, the social environment in which uh, this is taking place, and for the uh, governance of the cultural heritage um, as well. And indeed, a lot has been uh, researched also from the European Union around the subject of participatory governance of cultural heritage, which is definitely a priority. 
Uh, I would like to remind uh, everyone that there is the um, report. There are two reports, one uh, by the OMC uh, group and one by the uh, Voices of Cultural group, both on the, on the subject of participatory governance of cultural heritage. And I would also like uh, in this context to remind another project, which in the coming year, because uh, one, of the, one of the comments that came through in the chat, Sarah, was about whether it is possible to see the national uh, report and the 50 recommendations of your Portuguese report, uh, which will be um, finished and mm -hmm. done, completed by the end of the month, of October, of October. I understand. Yes, thank you. And, uh, right, and there will also be a summary in English. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand, surely I hope of these 50 uh, recommendations at least. Um, but apart from this, I would also like to, to point out that uh, there is a, another ongoing project um, which will be completed in a couple of years, in which uh, I, I guess uh, several of the participants in this uh, uh, conference are involved today. Um, and it's called the MOI, Museum of Impact. It's led by the Finnish uh, Agency uh, for, for Culture, the Museum uh, Agency for Culture and um, which is about um, testing and measuring the impact, the social impact of museums. There are 11 organizations and uh, it will be very interesting to see. Uh, it will develop a, a, a common framework indeed to, to uh, assess the social impact of museums and how much museums are involved with their public and their communities and so on. Um, we, we in, in Portugal, we absolutely would like to follow this um, group and research and maybe even take part because this is part of an um, encompassing strategy uh, of uh, the Ministry of Culture and the National Arts Plan in order to uh, measure the impact of uh, culture uh, in um, museums and other uh, cultural institutions, the social impact. I, I mean, right. So I think that indeed, the, 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 when the project is ready with with some at least interim outcomes or reports, they will be shared widely. Widely, uh, someone is also asking if there is a link to to this research report. I don't know whether uh, by research report I, I, is meant. I will. Yes. Uh, I will put the link uh, to the report. It's uh, now in a prim preliminary stage. So it will uh, be uh, finished um, in the end of October because we are now uh, receiving the, um, um, uh, the, the opinions and voices of other members uh, of museums and it's in the public um, phase. And, but I, I can share the link, of course. It's in Portuguese, uh, unfortunately, at this moment. We we will uh, send it to, uh, through the Google Translator and try to make yeah, sense. Yeah, that, I guess. okay. Yeah. All right. Any other comment, Matthias, that you would like to make? Uh, someone in the chat said, very important that the FARO Convention has been mentioned and more than mentioned, highlighted in this yeah. discussion. Well, I think that um, I will I will rather stay uh, uh, on, and if there will be any questions, suggestion, I'll be I'll be uh, very very pleased to respond to um, um, messages from the audience. I think in this format and the time, and with all the technical difficulties I had in the beginning, um, I think I'll, I'll I'll leave it at my initial initial comments, not to add to the confusion. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, I think that we uh, are on time, even though we've had some problems and delays. But uh, uh, if there are no further questions on the chat, and I don't see any, I would hand it over to Catherine. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank, Thank you, you Matthias. And we Thank will you. keep in touch, all of us. Yeah. You. Goodbye. Welcome back, everybody. The next discussion this afternoon is going to look at museums in the perspective of the future of Europe. Let me introduce Julia Pagel, the Secretary General of NEMO. She's a graduate of the Freie Universität here in Berlin, where she's joining us from home. Before she started to work for NEMO, Julia worked at the film market for the Bernale Film Festival and for the German Museums Association. From 2013 to 2017, 
Julia was member and vice president of the Executive Committee of Culture Action Europe. Since 2019, she's a member of the EU Commission Expert Group on Cultural Heritage. Julia has initiated and led various EU-funded cooperation projects, and she's edited several museum-related publications. Today, she's speaking to Sabina Fahayan, who has been a member of the European Parliament since 2009. Mrs. Fahayan currently chairs the Committee on Culture and Education. From 1983 to 1988, she studied architecture at the University in Aachen, and she has been a member of the Christian Democratic Union since 1990. From 94 to 2009, she was a member of the Aachen City Council, and from 1999 to 2009, she was a mayor of her hometown, Aachen. Once again, we're looking forward to an open discussion and hoping very much that you will all contribute with lots of questions on chat, and Julia will handle those. I hand over to Julia now. So, hello everybody. Um, uh, very honored to have these next 20 minutes with you, Ms. Vahain. Uh, I have prepared a few questions for you and for our participants. Please do ask questions via the chat. Uh, we'll have time after our discussion uh, uh, to uh, talk about everything that you want to know. Ms. Vahain, You've become the chair of the Culture and Education Committee of the European Parliament in 2019, but you've been a member for, of it for a long time. And we, the sector, have an ally in you at, uh, at EU level for culture. And I'm citing you saying that protection and promotion of European culture is the CULT Committee's highest priority. That's great. You were also very clear in your statement last year, encouraging European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen to bring back culture in the title of the portfolio of the then called Commissioner Maria Gabriel. Um, and two months later, the title of the Commissioner uh, had been changed again to Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Education, Culture and Youth. And this is, I think, a very good and promising start of a cooperation between uh, the cult committee and civil society organizations that advocated for the same cause. As a start into this topic, I would like to talk to you about the general role of culture at European level. Although we recently hear more and more that culture is uh, at the core of what brings Europe together, we don't see that very prominently reflected at policymaking level, nor uh, reflected in the European funding programs. And I would and I'd like to know how you feel about the proposal for the next funding programs relevant to culture, which are coming up in 2021, especially um, now looking at the, all the new challenges that the culture sector is dealing with. Yeah, I think uh, what is proposed at the moment is absolutely not sufficient, also taking into account that we have a situation under the COVID-19 crisis where the cultural and creative sector is... Uh, uh, really uh, impacted by the crisis in a very uh, crucial way. Um, I think we need to remain vocal about the importance of culture for our societies and not uh, just on European level, but also at national level and regional level, because uh, uh, culture is of systematic relevance. The money that uh, is proposed now at the moment, um, uh, also that we until now don't have, an earmark uh, for the recovery fund for the cultural sector. Uh, I think we have to fight there and we have to do more um, to, to, to get the awareness also to the financial ministers and to others uh, that something has to be done. Because during the crisis, we found out how important culture is for our everyday life. Um, uh, I think uh, culture is of systematic relevance that was shown during the last month. So literature, art, music, dance, poetry, uh, all these have helped people uh, uh, during the crisis um, to, to, to stand this uh, uh, lockdowns in a better way, uh, where social contacts have been strictly limited. Uh, these uh, possibilities were very crucial for people. People met outside in social social, social distance, everyone um, uh, on their own balcony, they sang songs, they made music together um, throughout self-isolation. Uh, it has been flourishing, uh, pointing uh, to performers, stepping into their creativity, 
um, to relay health guide, uh, guide, uh, guidelines and share messages of hope. Uh, and also many museums were, impact, were, were um, active at that time and made offers for people that had to stay at home. And that shows how important culture is for us. It's not a nice to have. It has to do with us as human beings. I can only agree to that <laughs> when we're when we're thinking because we are looking at at two different um, um, funding programs the next f cycle of programs that is coming up in the course of the new multi-annual financial framework in 2021 but we are also looking at the EU recovery fund which uh, I have um, talked to you yesterday about uh, the cult committee or some members of the cult committee have made a pledge which I will come to back to later um, you might have seen that Nemo has uh, published a study uh, about the impact of COVID-19 on museums in, in May uh, 2020. And one of the recommendations that we had is uh, a smart investment into museums uh, now. So it's not only about the immediate help for museums to reopen their doors, but it's also about investing into digital infrastructure and capacity building, for example, to support museums in their uh, digital transformation. But we have also seen that crisis resilience does not only mean that you have a crisis plan at hand, but that agile management and flexibility are the basis to handle such a crisis successfully. So um, I would just like to know, what, what did you demand from the EU Recovery Fund uh, to support the culture sector in the recovery and transformation? Today we will vote on a resolution um, in the European Parliament, or we had voted on it, uh, I didn't get the result until now, um, where we asked for a 2% earmark of the money out of the recovery fund, especially to invest this into future proof, into innovative uh, uh, cultural support. Uh, uh, the cultural sector and also museums and also other sectors have to invest in uh, digital, they have to uh, uh, develop new uh, uh, methods uh, to reach out to people, especially to younger people. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's very crucial that we help the sector to restart in a sustainable and innovative way. And that is where this money could be spent um, uh, out of this risk recovery fund. And uh, because we fear in the European Parliament that member states in their programs perhaps will not uh, cover the cultural and creative sector in an adequate way. We asked for this earmark um, and uh, I hope that in the negotiations uh, we will be successful in, in getting this uh, because uh, the cultural and creative sectors museum is very important also for other uh, sectors, uh, economical sectors. When I take a look to, uh, for example, uh, tourism, 30% uh, of our tourism is cultural tourism and it doesn't help just to, to help the, the restaurants and the hotels and the, the uh, touristic infrastructure to come up when 30% is also directly linked to culture. We also have uh, to help the cultural uh, heritage um, uh, um, places and also museums and uh, festivals uh, which are thriving the drivers for, um, for, 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 for tourism. Uh, in special areas that they are supported by uh, these programs too. And how do you think can we support uh, culture or can, can we as the sector be more um, sound when it comes to finding those metrics to show how much we are contributing, for example, to cultural tourism, for example, yeah. to what we're talking now about, about our social impact? First, I think it is important that we are uh, speaking with one uh, uh, language, that we are coming together throughout the different sectors of the CCS. Uh, the culture and creative sector is characterized uh, as a very diverse sector. We have very different uh, approaches when it comes to media, when it comes to film industry, when it comes to music, when it comes to museum, when it comes to uh, uh, other creative parts. Um, everyone is uh, mainly working on, on their own problems and their own uh, interests. But when we want to be vocal as a sector, when we want to be vocal also towards 
the ministries uh, of, of economy uh, to get really uh, supported and be part of the of the uh, uh, of the recovery programs then we have to speak uh, together we have to come up together with a with a position on that and that is what we try uh, uh, also as, as as cult committee uh, that we give the uh, sector a voice the, the whole sector a voice um, uh, towards those who are deciding uh, on the on the money that is spent uh, in the end and i think there we have to be uh, more vocal not just towards the cultural ministers but also towards those ministers who are responsible for finance and economy i know that the sector has sometimes some difficulties to see itself also as an economical power because the value for democracy the value for our for for our life every day's life for us as human beings we people just can live out of being a cultural uh, 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 being, uh, hum humanity is culture. And uh, I think what, what is important is uh, that we also see the aspect of our economical value in the sector. And uh, to show that we have 4.2% of the GDP in Europe is coming out of the cultural and creative sector. Between seven and eight million people and mainly young people are employed in the cultural and creative sector. So looking to the future, looking to a recovery, uh, normally we should get 4% of, of, the, of, the, of the recovery fund. Uh, we are just asking for two because we know that when we would get 2% out of this 750 billion, we would get more than we ever got before. We are fighting in the MFF for 2.8 billion in seven years divided uh, through 27 countries. Um, if we would get seven and a half or 40 billion out of the recovery fund, it would be more than we ever had on European level for cultural projects. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think one of the main problems is, is where is the money that we have? We, we get little money, but this would be a success if, if we got this, um, if we got this, um, this share. But how is it invested? And I think when we are when we are talking about strengthening the sector and the sector's voice, as you have just said it, because we have to speak with one voice in order to be heard, we also need these programs to support the sector in 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 uh, coming up with a sound framework uh, for for success. So I think this this should be part of of uh, what those programs should should support. I don't know if that's um, it hasn't been part in the in the past programs. While the criteria of being part of an eco, uh, of of economy, which is totally fine, it's it's good that there is uh, that that we see that culture is streamlined and transversal in in every of those um, in every of those sectors. Um, the support to come up with uh, measuring that really reflects what museums or this culture sector is, uh, in general is, is still uh, quite lacking. What I would like to know, and this uh, may be a bit uh, very personal, but what I would like to know, because we, you were saying when we were talking yesterday that you had time during the first weeks of the pandemic to surf the internet and look at some of um, the museum's website online because museums were closed and we all heard of this uh, big museum uh, digital wave that uh, came in all uh, our um, apartments. So which one did you like very much and why? Um, I visited the Pinakothek in Munich because I oh, was yeah. there Next. many, many years ago. Um, uh, and, and I just wanted to take a look uh, how it looks like uh, on, on the internet. I also use, uh, 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 also in normal times, uh, the Europeana platform because that gives access to different museums and uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a good entrance platform. Um, I also uh, uh, used, uh, was on the, on the, uh, um, the, the, the Instagram uh, site of the uh, Film Museum um, where there was a wonderful action uh, where they animated people to be active themselves and uh, uh, make scenes uh, of, of, of uh, new movies with themselves to, 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 to be creative themselves. Uh, it's also what the Getty Museum with, that, with its challenge did in this context. It, it was also amazing. The, the Getty Museum challenged 
similar to the uh, to the film Deutsche Film Museum made uh, uh, um, this this kind of uh, active uh, activities where the people could be creative themselves too in in uh, a link it in a linking to um, to to the museum or to the uh, to the movies and it was was really uh, that brought me to laugh uh, I, and the, the fun they had the people to 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 create themselves the pictures uh, it was really wonderful to see that uh, how people got themselves creative and that showed uh, to me especially that uh, people need culture that people need these things um, and that it's uh, not just a nice to have but really essential for our life that we have these uh, creative and cultural sector that we have museums where we can interactively uh, participate in, in what they have and it's also important uh, what i uh, took a look also on the internet was uh, to 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 watch our cultural heritage sites. It, there are so many uh, cultural heritage sites. Meanwhile, online, uh, you have online guided tour through, through different uh, sites. And there was su such a big uh, uh, chance and possibility during that times uh, to be part of, of these wonderful activities. Also that the Bolshoi Theater, for example, uh, yeah. made uh, online, uh, um, uh, dancing um, uh, venues and, and it, it was really uh, very amazing how the cultural sector stepped directly towards this uh, digital uh, approach. Uh, musicians sitting outside uh, making music and, and filming themselves and streaming that throughout the internet but uh, what, what is important that we, we cannot take this all for granted. We have also to take a look that those who are creators, those who, uh, the musicians, the the writers, the authors, um, all those, the performing, uh, who is someone who is uh, dealing with performing arts, uh, um, they have to live out of that what they get. And uh, during the Corona times, it was very often that it, uh, that people took cultural content for granted. Um, and uh, I think we must step towards um, a structure where on platforms the cultural sector is also reimbursed in a fair and good manner uh, when people uh, are visiting, entering uh, such digital uh, possibilities and use them that also those who are creating and those uh, who have to finance all these get their fair share. Yeah. I would like to uh, come back to um, the first bit that you were saying uh, about the museum initiatives. Um, and we noticed that the museum initiatives, such as, for example, the one on, on um, Instagram, uh, the uh, museum from home, for example, uh, that these were the most successful initiatives and all of the most successful initiative had one thing in common and that was that it was completely curated by the public mm -hmm. so the museum seized authority they didn't say this is what you have to do this is how you have to look at the uh, at, at our artworks they said this is this is what you can do please go ahead mm -hmm. <laughs> and we let you and and we let you just do what you want to do and interestingly this is um, a dynamic that has been discussed in the museum for a qu quite a long time already, seizing, seizing authority and letting the communities participate. This is something that museums are doing and have started to do years ago, but the same the same tendency and the same dynamic happens on a digital level as well. And I think this is something that museums might also want to take into account when, when they are organizing their digital activities and offers. It's not about showing something that you think is important, is showing something and let the, the audience decide what's important for them and creating this added value uh, out of this. Yeah. There is a big, I, chance, I would, there yeah, is a big chance also for museums to open up also to their archives. I cannot present, mm -hmm. for example, in an art exhibition uh, all the works I have uh, in, in a museum. But uh, when you go digital, you have the possibility also to come up with uh, 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 works that are in the archive, that are stored uh, somewhere behind, that might that seem not to be actual, but perhaps for some people it is actual. So it broadens uh, the possibility to access uh, cultural works. Yeah. 
I would like to come back because we only have a short time left and I want to save some time for the Q&A with uh, our participants. But I would like to uh, come to the challenges for museums because we've been talking a lot about the potential that museums have, uh, potential uh, to, to support museums in uh, being democratic and being open and being informed and being engaged. What do you see as the biggest challenge for museums, a challenge that prevents them from tapping their potential to connect communities and being a reliable source of information? I think a big challenge is uh, that we have to, to start rethinking how we uh, present museums and what a museum uh, is for people. Uh, I think that's a very important uh, thing we have to do. We have to see, to look at a museum on the one hand, on the cultural heritage side. I think a museum has a value, also a value as such, but we also have to take into account which value it has for the recipients of what we want to show. Uh, to look at a museum from the, from the, the users, from the visitor side. Um, uh, on the one hand, we have to bring people back also physically to the museums, but on the other hand, we have to, to to, to bring the appetite to go to a museum, perhaps also online, especially when it comes to young people. Um, I see that when, when uh, uh, teachers, for example, want to prepare for a museum's visit, uh, it's good to have possibility to have materials beforehand, uh, but this material must reach out to the want to reach. And sometimes there is a lag between what young people uh, want to uh, see and what, what's interesting for them and what we think, what we want to show. And I think it's very important to have this interaction and also digitization brings another possibility for this kind of interaction. Yeah, I, I very much agree with that. Um, I'm now looking at the um, chat um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to, to read as, as quickly as possible. Um, okay. I'm, I'm, I will read aloud a comment which, which I like by my wonderful colleague Maria Vlahu. And she says, can we expect citizens to be vocal about culture? Do they value it and how? And when will this become something more than a conversation within the family? So preaching to the converted, I, pr I presume. Most people didn't even realize that during the lockdown, they turned to culture because of their understanding, uh, which is the understanding that we, the professionals, form for them what is culture, um, of what culture is. And I think this is actually a very interesting aspect because I don't know if you've maybe seen this uh, picture which uh, was uh, floating around the internet in the first, first weeks of the pandemic, which said, uh, Try, try not listening to music, watch films, listening to music, read books uh, during a pandemic in the lockdown. <laughs> and <laughs> understanding that this is what keeps what, what kept us alive during the pandemic. How do you think and maybe what, what can the, the parliament as you as, as elected representatives of European citizens, what can you do um, in order to make people understand what the value of this culture is? Um, I think uh, the, the lockdown showed for many people directly that if they cannot go to a concert, if they cannot go to a theater, if they were not allowed to go, when I include sports, uh, to a football game, or to uh, 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 events they normally w wanted to go to, all the festivals that were visitors, everything was closed down, cinemas were closed down, mm -hmm. and people were missing that. When they don't have it, they realize that culture is an important part of their life. But I think we, we have to raise awareness uh, that uh, uh, we have to fight for this also when we want to, to have the recovery. Why? Was it uh, uh, easier to go to a restaurant in the lockdown phase than to go to a cinema? Uh, why was it allowed to do this and not to do that? And that showed um, there were sectors that where, where also the politicians were more aware 
about um, and uh, there were parts there where there were less and it had also to be for me um, uh, it has to it has to do with um, um, uh, the awareness also of people uh, if they take it for granted if it's just there or if they really reflect on having it or, or not having it. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what we have to do also as parliament, uh, but also every one of us is to raise the awareness for the meaning of culture. Um, uh, uh, culture is, is, a, is a kind of, of education. It's, it's social inclusion, inclusion. It's, it's inspiring also our work. It's calming us when we are upset. Uh, it's encouraging us. It gives us uh, impact. Uh, a new, a new uh, uh, um, also um, uh, energy uh, and museums bring also people together and uh, expand our horizons. It uh, teaches us about the world and provides moments of, of peaceful, peaceful reflection. And all these things, um, people are not always aware because they have it uh, and they just recognize uh, these things when it's not there. And uh, I think what we have to do is to, to keep this awareness, to, 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 to make people awake, uh, to waken them up, that they have to uh, also to support uh, uh, the cultural sector and support uh, creative people uh, because their own creativity is also depending uh, on, on inspiration coming out of the cultural and creative sector and also out of museums. It uh, leads me to uh, the maybe last question, which comes to from Margarita Zani, which is, will this be reflected? Will you help to reflect this in the EU strategy 2030, in addition to the green economy? I think that's uh, that's uh, very interesting because it, culture wasn't very prominent in the EU strategy 2020. <laughs> only in agriculture, if I remember correctly. <laughs> That's all, also a kind of culture, yeah. <laughs> um, So can we change that for the 2030 strategy? Uh, we are fighting for that. The Culture Committee, um, I think, is at the moment quite vocal in all these things. We um, reached the, the debate on, on, on the cultural recovery. Uh, we uh, made a, had a report in the large, last legislative period where we raised also uh, the cultural aspects when it comes to regional development fund, because also regional development, um, uh, cult the cultural sector must be part of the regional development. So that we clearly wanted to have uh, access also for cultural projects to these kinds of funding um, to raise the awareness of the meaning for our cultural diversity as one of the basics, basics of our uh, also democracy structure and the European values. And uh, when we take a look to the 2030 strategy, yes, there is a big focus on green, but um, uh, also um, the cultural and creative sectors can help uh, uh, to green our societies, to, 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 to make an ecological change. Uh, we need the cultural sector also for this. And that's the reason why we always say uh, culture must be part of all these programs and not just as a side effect, but must come to the core of European politics because uh, uh, our, our uh, European values, our uh, rule of law discussions, our uh, uh, structures of, of our democracy are also depending on a on a um, uh, um, on a very lively cultural sector. Um, culture is reflecting uh, what 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 politics make. Culture is reflecting our societies. Culture is reflecting also uh, our problems we have. And culture is the best way of European integration. And if we just put that to the side, it will not. Uh, 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 help us to to really to to come to a European identity. We need the culture, the cultural exchange. We need the var varieties. We have the diversities in culture, um, and uh, that is why we fight very clear as European Parliament and especially the the Cult Committee uh, to to have a, a stronger position uh, for culture. We were absolutely upset. You always mentioned that at the beginning when we had the. Um, new naming uh, yes. and, and for for the for the commissioners and culture didn't take place. It was part of the description of the job, but it was not 
not named in any way and we couldn't understand that uh, how they did it just for uh, to have easier uh, easier titles for the commissioners uh, to skip out one of the most important parts um, for me most important parts we have and uh, this fight was also successful and we will continue with our fight to bring the awareness. Meanwhile, it is always when we discuss about the MFF, when we discuss about um, the future of Europe, when we discuss about uh, uh, democracy and rule of law, that media and culture are in the core of the discussion. We have made uh, several um, uh, uh, special committees, for example, on artificial intelligence. We have a special committee on uh, disinformation and fake news, where also uh, culture is represented, where we also have the media sector represented, where we have um, um, people from the cult committee also being part of these committees. And that shows already that Parliament has understood that culture is core, and that's not uh, a niche, but uh, a horizontal issue that uh, has its place in, in all policies we are making on the European level. But I hope that also the Council understands that and the member states themselves don't see culture just as this nice to have issue, but really as a core for our democracies and our societies, for social inclusion, for education, but also as a value in as such. Ms. Verheyen, thank you very much for your encouraging words. I I think all of us uh, know that we really have an ally and and a fighter for uh, our cause and and culture in general. So thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you, everybody out there, for your time. And uh, I think I know that some of the questions have uh, not been answered, but um, maybe we'll have the time to kind of group them and and give an answer later on. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you also from my side. And you can always write uh, uh, on my email address uh, your questions and we will answer you that. Thank you very much to Julia Pagel and Sabina Fahayan for that very good summary and, and conversation about what the future of culture is within Europe and um, also for giving us the latest from the European Parliament today. So to sum up, um, you'll have to excuse me here, I've got some very messy notes in front of me, but I'm going to try and summarise a little bit all the things that we have uh, discussed today and that we've heard today. One of the main points that comes across is that during the pandemic, everyone has realised more than ever how important museums are and how important culture and the arts are. Um, there's also a feeling that museums over many years of becoming more and more people-centered and also that their tasks and the expectations of museums have grown exponentially. Um, that raised lots of questions about priorities. Karen Grohn asked whether the bottom line, as in the financial bottom line, should really be the bottom line for museums. At the same time, I found what Sabina Fahayan said extremely important and extremely interesting that museums should be a lot more um, emphatic about their contribution to the economy. So uh, they should definitely make very clear that they, um, they, have, they make a massive contribution to GDP and that this is something they are perhaps not very um, stating very loudly, very clearly and in a coordinated way something that needs to be worked on. Perhaps that's something that should be thought about within this forum in future. Um, another thing that I came back to, I, I wondered whether perhaps we had left out one area of social responsibility, hearing about how uh, Denmark had helped people with stress and got everyone sharing crochet hooks and wool. Um, this whole idea of dealing with stress in the pandemic and how museums can could could help with that with stress relief should we care is this something we should think about too on a more uh, um, uh, on another dark subject let's say 
um, we heard from the Council of Europe about how there is a universal, certainly within Europe, we are experiencing an assault on knowledge, science and facts. There are attempts to manipulate and distort history, to weaponize culture. Um, and this has made access to museums more and more important. We don't need to be, museums do not need to be ideological activists, but they are part of the immunity. And that I think is very important. They are part of what creates a sense of community, what creates a common understanding of our cultures and our civilization. And on that note as well, we come to the issue of political education and how, um, how museums can contribute to educating the young in political education. Um, how to counter fake news and conspiracy theories is one area that's being looked at here in Berlin and a very interesting and important pilot project. So um, I'm sure that I have left lots and lots of things out there, but there was also lots and lots to think about, lots more issues that I'm sure that we will come back to in future. Um, Oh, the other thing that I perhaps ought to mention that was also extremely interesting in Finland, the idea of promoting democracy has entered the law. And this is a very radical thing, first time anyone has done that. So that museums should promote democracy is now law in Finland. And that puts an additional pressure, adding to the tasks that we have already talked about, adding also to the economic pressures that we have already talked about, talked about, but also adding to the economic clout that museums should and could wield. I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to hand over to David Vuillon, who is joining us now to talk about the rest of this series. And he will be talking to two colleagues, one from Portugal, one from Slovenia, about the, um, the, the conferences to come in this series on museums and social responsibility. So I'll hand over to David now. Hi, Hello. Alexandra. <laughs> Hello, some technical difficulties. <laughs> Sorry. Great to meet you. To the, to the right time. Yeah. We were speaking <laughs> with, uh, with Clara about the, the takeaways of the days, of, the, of this day, before we come uh, to the content of the next uh, conferences. Just a question, another question, Clara. You yeah. had an experience with, with a networking function today? Yes, I, I succeeded. In one of the coffee breaks, uh, I was also very interested in uh, experiencing it and seeing how it works. And it was really nice. I uh, met a colleague from Poland, from Mimoz, an institution I visited a few years ago. And uh, we, we were in, we will be in touch, of course, for the organization and dissemination of our next conference. It was a, a very nice experience. And I also enjoyed um, the participation in the uh, uh, meet, uh, meet the speaker at uh, the speaker's lounge uh, and had a very nice experience uh, talking to, to Karen from, from Denmark. So, but just to finish my, uh, my, my answer about uh, the issues and the topics, I think that uh, the beginning of uh, uh, this day was uh, very well uh, uh, completed and uh, we had a, a very interesting bridge uh, with this uh, last uh, intervention that I so much appreciated and uh, I think we are very all very hopeful about uh, uh, the, the role that culture and of course museums will play in the recovery plan uh, for the next 10 years so it was really very interesting and what I uh, my takeaway take would be that uh, how raise uh, aware, awareness of the value of museums 
for our audiences. This would be one of the main challenges for the, the conference in, in Lisbon. Thank you, Clara. Uh, Alexandra, just before we speak about the subject of the conference you are going to organize, uh, just okay. some, some thought or shortly, could you, could, could you tell us what are your takeaways uh, from today? First of all, thank you to all the organizers in Berlin. It was uh, very nice, although I have to say that there has been a lot of happening around me today and my son just finished his final exams, so I'm crazy. Um, and um, But uh, my takeaway was that uh, we should definitely talk about this topic again and thank God that we are meeting again I hope in Portugal, not just online, and I hope in Slovenia, not just online. So um, Clara mentioned the awareness of the importance of the museums, and that is something that we will definitely have to talk about again. And uh, I think that COVID-19 just opened up new questions and new problems that we have to deal with. So this uh, conference could not come at a better time and um, I'm really looking forward to our next, next two meetings. So the next step of this conference is uh, this evening we are going to have a, um, a drink uh, with the participant, with the speaker. Tomorrow also there we are going to have some, uh, some webinars. But then next year in April um, 2020 in Lisbon, if we can meet live we are going to speak about participation networking and partnership can you give us some more information Clara? oh we don't we i don't hear you anymore uh, sorry, ah, sorry. Uh, the conference in lisbon will be the the second chapter of the story we want to to tell and the better we want to raise questions um we, we think the conference will take place in 8 and 9 April in Lisbon. I hope it will be live. Of course, it will depend uh, on the situation on the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so we will let you know which will be the format and the program, of course. Uh, we are thinking the, this conference in Lisbon uh, in three main uh, dimensions. Uh, I would say that the first one would, would be to uh, present uh, the main questions uh, of the conference in Berlin and uh, uh, to systematize these questions, to summarize them and taking them as uh, the, the departure uh, points for the, our conference. Uh, the second dimension would be uh, around the topic of uh, uh, education and mediation on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, museum networks and participation with uh, practical examples uh, on the ground uh, from Portuguese experiences and uh, in comparison with other European uh, ones. And, and finally, uh, we will have uh, um, a third topic on the, uh, visions uh, on the future. Uh, of course, it will be a chance to present and discuss uh, this uh, research report where will be, that will be concluded uh, this, this year uh, called Museums in the Future, as we all already know by the presentation of Sarah, one of my colleagues of this uh, working group. And uh, um, as uh, some of the main topics of this uh, um, project uh, were around uh, networks and partnerships, around uh, audience development, digital transition, management uh, organization. Um, we will have the chance to debate some of these recommendations and, of course, or always in comparison, in debate with other uh, experiences. And I hope then we will have uh, uh, the right bridge with a couple of uh, uh, important, relevant questions to make the bridge for the conference in Slovenia in September 2021. So we make the, the bridge to Slovenia. Uh, Clara spoke about vision for the future. 
I think that will be your main topic, Alexandra. Yes, that is true. So it is uh, a bit difficult to talk about what is going to be happening in Slovenia uh, because uh, we are going to try and answer the questions that are going to be raised not only here in Berlin this, uh, today and tomorrow, but also uh, that are going to be raised in Portugal. So we have to wait for that uh, part of the conference as well. We are going to meet in Maribor, Slovenia on 23rd and 24th of September 2020. 21, at the time when Slovenia is going to have a presidency of the European Union. Um, what we are going to be thinking about is um, what awaits us, what awaits the museums in the future, uh, what, uh, the, whether the museums are going to have to change and in what way they're going to have to change, who should we partner with during, uh, with, uh, during that process, and uh, if the po uh, conference in Portugal will raise questions, as Clara said, then I hope that we will find the answers in Maribor. Well, I would add uh, something that, uh, that it's a pleasure for, for us to work with you. It's the first time this German, Slovenian, Portuguese uh, work uh, together with, with Nemo is, 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 is a real pleasure. And it was and it is very interesting to think about this, this great question of uh, social responsibility. I, I think museums are naturally organizations that are responsibly, that, that have a social responsibility. They know that, but it's so good uh, regularly to think about what, what it means today. We, we always have to, to, uh, to, to, to react to, to, to rethink what what it what it means yeah. so it's um uh, I, I like it very much yeah same here <laughs> i like the triangle we made yeah <laughs> so we, uh, <laughs> <with me>. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for this insight about uh this uh, this this project of course we don't have the program we don't have exactly the date i we are working working on it uh, thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Clara. Thank you, David. Thank you. <laughs> and now I in invite all of uh, you, dear participants, if you can, if you want, you can join us for a drink at 6 p.m. So in one hour, we I invite you to an online reception. Usually, when we f when we meet live, we have an online reception. We have a real reception with a cup of. Uh, something to drink so we are trying to do that uh, online so uh, to finish off the first conference day please at six o'clock uh, come back please grab a drink of your choice for example wine but if you drink wine you are going to drink responsibly of course <laughs> and you can meet the speakers again and meet uh, together again and we have a guest at six o'clock it's a winemaker and she will offer us some insight for a short presentation about wine wine making and wine in general so see you at, uh, at six and thank you very much and back to uh, to the Borden Museum, I think, or uh, and uh, and see you at six. Thank you. Bye. 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 So this is the end of the official part of the conference today. As you've heard, there's an option to have a glass of wine later on, six p.m., with a winemaker who will be there to discuss her lovely Moselle wines from the Moselle region of Germany. Um, we hope very much, of course, that you will participate in the workshops tomorrow. I'll give a quick rundown of the details, but they are also in the programme. There are three workshops at midday. The first is on the impact orientation and impact analysis in the work of museums, and that's Bettina Kurz. The second is how can social inclusion become a crucial part of museum work with Fabian Schneebler. And the third one is on modern technology for the museum audience. And that's with Malgazata Zajac of Poland. I think I may have said that wrong. Um, but anyway, so that's the three um, sessions tomorrow. Also, don't forget to check the expo area. Lots of museums, lots of participants have been putting their projects into the expo area. And we hope very much that you will all 
look at them. For today, that's it from me here at the Bodo Museum in Berlin. Have a great evening. <laughs>